By the time Caesar concluded the celebrations of his four triumphs in Rome, he had spent the better part of the previous 14 years away on military campaigns. Between his invasion of Gaul and the Civil War, which saw his campaigns extend into Egypt, Pontus, and Africa, Caesar had accumulated so much personal wealth through plunder, and the sale of enemies into slavery, that he had displaced Marcus Crassus, the sole surviving son of Caesar's one-time fellow triumvir, Marcus Licinius Crassus, as the wealthiest man in the Roman Empire. Now possessing abundant financial resources, Caesar began paying back his loyal legions, many of whom had marched with him since 58 BC. To each soldier within his legions, Caesar distributed a talent of silver, which was equivalent to approximately 15 years of back pay. For his centurions, Caesar doubled this payment, gifting them two talents of silver, and to his generals and high-ranking staff, Caesar offered four talents of silver. In addition to monetary rewards for his multitude of legions, making many wealthy in a single stroke, Caesar gifted each citizen of Rome an amount approximating four months' worth of wages. Besides compensating his legions, Caesar needed to settle more than 20,000 retiring veterans on farmland somewhere within the empire, in accordance with the tradition established by his uncle, the third founder of Rome, Gaius Marius. Employing his authority as dictator, Caesar legislated a buyout program for farmers whose lands had plummeted in value during the civil war years. Caesar decreed that the state would purchase, at pre-war values, all farmland being voluntarily sold by owners. With this massive buyout, Caesar could commence settling some of his legions. Though it would be many years before enough new farms became available to settle all of Caesar's veterans, the first in line would be the veterans of the four legions Caesar had inherited along with his pro-consulship of 58 BC, the 7th, 8th, 9th, and 10th. But farmland wasn't the only asset diminished by the civil war. Many senators, those who had not died fighting in the wars, or as a result of urban gang warfare, had simply retired from politics when armed conflict between the Caesarians and Pompeians became unavoidable. This left Rome's Senate pitifully understaffed, making it difficult to govern Rome's many provinces. In response, Caesar used a combination of his dictatorial and censorial powers to lower the minimum financial requirements for senatorial membership, and began filling the Senate's vacant seats. Many of Rome's newly appointed senators were former centurions within Caesar's legions who had received almost 30 years' worth of pay as a gift from their general. Other senatorial seats were bestowed as repayment for massive loans from Italy's nobility, whom Caesar owed for further funding of the civil war. And the last group of empty seats within Rome's Senate were awarded to the Gallic aristocracy who had allied with Caesar during his conquest of their homeland in exchange for a voice in Roman government. From well below 300 seats, the Senate now held approximately 1,000 senators, most of whom were loyal to Caesar. Next on the list of Caesar's constitutional reforms, he tackled the grain dole. Between the creation of the Lex Sempronia Frumentaria, by tribune of the plebs, Gaius Sempronius Gracchus, the Lex Porcia Frumentaria quadrupling the size of the entitlement during the tribunate of Marcus Porcius Cato, and the Lex Clodia Frumentaria, in which Publius Clodius legislated to give the grain to the people for free, the grain dole had become its own sub-political moneymaker. Those who had long ago risen out of poverty still received a monthly grain stipend by bribing officials to keep their names on the grain dole, while those now in poverty lacked the necessary funds to bribe officials so that their names could be added. With the truly hungry unable to get assistance, and Rome's newly created middle class slowly improving their socio-economic station on the backs of Rome's poor, Caesar restructured the frumentaria laws, cutting the more than 300,000 grain recipients in half, and assigning his loyalists the administration of the law so that only Rome's most needy would receive help from the state. Caesar then addressed the matter of providing governors for Rome's provinces. With so many ex-consuls and ex-praetors either retired or casualties of the civil wars, more high-ranking senatorial offices were needed to govern the provinces. Caesar increased the number of praetors elected each year from 8 to 10. 
by choosing the candidates himself, then submitting them to the assemblies for election, Caesar began packing the pool of potential governors for Rome's provinces, while simultaneously disempowering the voting assemblies and voice of the people. For the larger and more prestigious provinces, those more appropriately governed by ex-consuls rather than ex-praetors, Caesar used his dictatorial powers to promote his partisans to offices with a newly created title of, quote, the dignity of a former consul, end quote. This allowed Caesar to reward those he favoured with the most lucrative pro-consulships in the empire. But, to make certain that none of his provincial appointments could grow powerful enough to use their legions to challenge him, Caesar placed term limits on Rome's governorships. Pro-praetors had to legally resign their office after only one year, and pro-consuls were forced to abdicate after two years. Caesar next turned his attention to the Roman calendar, which had fallen badly out of sync with the seasonal year during his absence from Rome and his neglect of his duties as Pontifex Maximus. Although the disparity between the seasonal and the calendar year had worked to Caesar's advantage when he slipped past Marcus Calpurnius Bibulus in order to chase Pompeius Magnus into Greece, it was now time to fix Rome's calendar. Together with Sicigenes of Alexandria, a Greek astronomer who had travelled to Rome with the court of Cleopatra, Caesar replaced Rome's 355-day lunar calendar with a 365-day solar calendar that was modelled very closely on Egypt's calendar. Rather than the Pontifex Maximus finding places throughout each year to insert the extra 10 days, Caesar and Sicigenes developed a 12-month calendar, with the extra 10 days peppered throughout, thus making the months of Januarius, March, Maius, Quintilis, Sextilis, October, and December, 31 days. Because Sicigenes understood that the solar year was actually 365.25 days, Februarius, which had remained 28 days for religious reasons, was given one extra day every four years, which we still observe today as leap year. Caesar scheduled his new Julian calendar, which he also removed from the jurisdiction of Rome's Pontifex Maximus, to begin on the first day of Januarius of the 45 BC year. But because the calendar was still approximately three months out of sync with the seasons, due to Caesar's long absence from Rome and his failure to readjust it each year, the extra 80 days were added to the end of the 46 BC year, making it the longest recorded year in human history, at 445 days, and prompting the Romans to nickname it the Annus Confusionus, or the Year of Confusion. In addition to packing the Senate with legislators who owed their new status to him, revamping the grain dole to win over the urban poor, and funneling his loyalists into the top postings within the empire, Caesar also dedicated a temple to Venus Genetrix, the goddess from whom the Julii claimed divine descent. At the public dedication of this temple, which housed a statue of the goddess Venus herself, a second statue was unveiled to the shock and confusion of the Senate and of the people of Rome. Standing alongside Venus was an image of Egypt's queen Cleopatra gleaming in gilded bronze, and holding her son, Ptolemy Caesar, in her arms as she gazed out over the people of Rome. The Senate and citizens of Rome, however, were not sure what to make of this unveiling. Not only had Caesar, husband to the politic and dutiful Calpurnia Pisonus, just pulled off the largest power grab in Roman history, but he had brought his mistress and illegitimate son to Rome, where he installed her in his Tiber Island villa as though it were some royal Egyptian court. Now Cleopatra, worshipped in Egypt and other parts of Rome's eastern empire as the manifestation of the goddess Isis, stood alongside Venus, the very mother of Rome's mythical founder, Aeneas. Those aristocratic senators whose influence had suddenly been diluted by Caesar's personal and political intervention in their beloved senate began to wonder quietly. Just what were Caesar's real ambitions?